Hey there everyone, welcome back to Utility Sports. Super excited for yet another NBA mock draft. And with March Madness here, it is officially here. We're in the middle of March and the NCAA tournament is about to begin today, which means we've got a lot to break down in this video. Some potential players we're going to see all throughout March here. Players who could be increasing their stocks, decreasing their stocks. There's a lot yet to learn about these prospects as the season comes to an end here over the next couple of weeks. And of course, we get an NCAA tournament champion. So I'm very excited for it. And with special regards to that, we're going to be doing a lottery simulator today. We have not done one of these yet in the 2024 NBA draft cycle. I'm extremely excited for it. Of course, the top four picks are done through the lottery. Let's simulate now here and see exactly what happens. Washington sticks with the number one pick, but we've got some movement. San Antonio moves up to number two. The Rockets move up to number three via the Brooklyn Nets and the Lakers, uh-oh, the Lakers pick. That moves up to number four, which means the Pelicans likely would allow that to convey. They do have a deferment option back to 2025 if they want it, but moving up to four is a pretty good option for them, it seems like. And then at five, we have Detroit. This is the furthest that they could fall down. Actually, the second furthest they could fall down. It's possible that they could move to six, depending on where their actual record lies this season. Of course, Washington is now the worst team in the league. Charlotte at six. Seven is the Trailblazers, and so on and so forth. The Spurs have two top eight picks in this lottery, so I'm very excited. Hopefully, you guys do enjoy the mock draft portion of it, and now let's jump into it. All right, here we are now with our actual mock draft. And first overall, as promised, the Washington Wizards. And this is an interesting spot for them specifically. You guys know with these mock drafts, I love to talk about the team context and really talk through and negotiate what I expect these teams to actually do. Again, this is not a big board. This is not what I would do if I was running the teams. This is more so talking what I expect to happen and what I could see these teams targeting in the actual draft. So the Wizards first overall are such a fascinating example of a team to talk about because a lot of fans I'm sure are going to look at the point guard position and say, we want a point guard, we need a point guard. And while I do agree with that, and I think that is a big need for the Washington Wizards, finding a true floor general, someone who can be their long-term franchise point guard, obviously not Tyus Jones, not Jordan Poole, someone who's going to probably be a lot better than both of those guys. The issue is I don't know if that player exactly exists here for Washington. I don't know if they would take him first overall. So what I do think here is the Wizards instead address defense and they're looking for a player who could maybe become a building block to a defensive identity in the NBA. And first overall, that player here is Alex Saar out of Perth, playing for the Wildcats this year in the NBL. He has been nothing short of spectacular for them coming off the bench at times, having a big impact for them when he's on the floor, scoring rather efficiently at a high volume for his minutes per game. I actually have a breakdown on Alex Saar up on the channel. I really recommend you check that out, especially if you're a Wizards fan and you want to know more about him. That's the video for you. But in this video, in this mock draft, we're going to talk about Saar and what he brings to Washington specifically for a team that I think doesn't really have a true infrastructure on the way that they can play defensively. I think Alex R could be a real key to unlocking a lot of different play styles and a lot of different ways to navigate building a collective team identity on the defensive end of the floor. He's lengthy, he can be a weak side shot blocker, rim protector. Those are the things that are probably going to come easier for him. But he also has flashed the fluidity, the ability to guard out in space, do a few different things as well. When it comes to maybe blitzing ball screens, hard hedging ball screens, you can play him and drop a bit. So you have a lot of different pick and roll functionality. He's athletic, he runs the floor extremely well. And offensively, there's been a lot of flashes as a shot creator. Now he has to really put those things together. He's relatively reliant on touch and shot making as a big man, which is not necessarily what you wanna build your team around from an efficiency standpoint. The three point shot isn't necessarily there yet, but it's coming in strides, I would say. And I think adjusting to the NBA might be a little bit of a hurdle for Sar coming in and just adjusting to the length of the three point line and the overall battle of being an NBA center, I think will be a little bit of a hurdle for him, like it is for most young big men. That is not just new or unique to Sar. That is a typical struggle that most young big men have. In the league, we even saw it with Victor Wembanyama a little bit this year, even though he's an absurd 
player and absurd, absurd talent. Sar's not quite as talented. He's also French. And I think for Washington, now that you have Bilal Koulibaly, who I think is an intriguing defensive chess piece, putting Alex Sar next to him not only strengthens that chemistry, that duo, I think, on the defensive end of the floor, but going into next year's draft, if there's a will, there's a way. Maybe Washington ends up with the first pick again next year, and they land Cooper Flay, giving them one of the most unique defensive front courts in the league with a trio of Koulibaly, Flag, and Sar. I would be all in on something like that. And then from there, it's about finding offensive talent around that trio. I think that would be something that they could probably do relatively easily when it comes to adding shooting, adding ball handling, playmaking, and probably keeping a good core of their roster that already is intact anyway with some of the other draft picks that they have. Remember, the Wizards do have another pick in this draft. So Wizards fans, stay tuned to figure out who I go with later on in this mock draft for Washington. Moving on to pick two, we have the San Antonio Spurs here now, and I think the Spurs are another fascinating team to talk about, especially with them at pick number two. Victor Wembanyama, of course, is the identity, the team building block, the face of the franchise, but I think when you're looking at what the Spurs could do second overall, if you would have asked me a couple months ago, I probably would have said Nikola Topic is the guy if Alex R is already off the board, although I'm kind of wavering a little bit on that. Topic, obviously his injury has shaken things up. Uh, we haven't gotten to see as much of him as I think a lot of scouts and you know people would like to see when it comes to drafting him second overall, especially in a draft where there's a lot of questions and a lack of clarity already. So we're going to go with someone who the analytics are going to love and I think is just flat out a really good basketball player. Second overall, the San Antonio Spurs select Reed Shepard out of Kentucky. He is an impressive player and an impressive talent shooting the ball extremely well from three this year. And there's a big misconception right now around Reed Shepard that I really want to use this mock draft to address. He's a false ceiling player. And I know a lot of draft analysts, a lot of people that you're going to watch or listen to between now and the NBA draft are going to say, listen, the value of Reed Shepard is based on whether or not he can be a primary pick and roll ball handler 30, 40 times a game. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is complete cap. That is just not true. And it is not the way that you should look at Reed Shepard as a valuable prospect in the 2024 NBA draft. And the reason why, when you have a player who can toggle between multiple roles on a team, those players typically with their versatility, oftentimes outvalue other players of similar caliber. For Shepard, listen, he might grow and become a really good high volume pick and roll ball handler. Of course, that would be awesome for him, but I'm not going to evaluate him solely with the idea of, well, he has to become that for him to be a really good draft pick in the top five in 2024. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite. The fact that I'm capable of believing that he's going to be a good pick and roll ball handler, a good pick and roll player, with the ball in his hands on 15, 20 pick and rolls a game, maybe, maybe even less than that. It might be anywhere from, you know, five to 12, whatever the number ends up being, right? He doesn't have to be a heliocentric player like a Luka Doncic for him to have value and for him to be a really good pick. And the reason why is because he can toggle between multiple roles. And one that he's going to excel at is playing off the basketball, playing quick with the ball in his hands, making decisions. He's not going to screw a ton of things up. And when you look at the way San Antonio plays, a team that still is a pass first team, a pass first organization, of course, that comes from Greg Popovich and his style of coaching. I think Shepard is a seamless fit into that style of play. I think his shooting will do wonders next to Victor Wembanyama. Just stretching the floor, adding more spacing. And again, with the ability to run a pick and roll, whether it's X amount of times or Y amount of times, I trust that he's going to be able to not only with his shooting ability, score out of the pick and roll with Victor Wembanyama as the screener, but I also think he's going to be able to facilitate for Victor a lot, finding him on short rolls, maybe even on long rolls a decent amount. And I think just making Wembanyama's life easier is a great step in the right direction for San Antonio, who has another pick here in the top 10 as well. Now moving on to pick number three, we have the Houston Rockets. Of course, this pick comes from the Brooklyn Nets. So you're looking at a real chance here for Houston to add some premium talent still at the top of the 2024 draft to an already stacked, loaded, young roster that I think has a ton of potential. Jalen Green coming off a Western Conference Player of the Week. I've been telling everyone all year long, hold the patience on Jalen Green. Looks like it's starting to pay off a bit. He's been playing some of his best basketball of his career over the last few weeks or so. And I think Houston, when you look at Cam Whitmore, Amon Thompson, 
Uh, obviously, Alperin Shingun, who has been the headliner for them this season, unfortunate that he went down with an injury just recently. But this Rockets team is loaded with young talent. Of course, Dylan Brooks, I thought was a good pickup. We'll see how long Fred Van Vliet really spends in Houston. But this is a great chance to complement this Rockets young core with another piece that fits. And they need shooting. And for that reason, I have the Rockets here third overall going with Zachary Rissacher out of France. And he has been an impressive prospect this year playing for JL Berg over in France. And the reason why is he shoots the ball at a very high clip and he's not gun shy about it at all. Shooting over 45% from three all year long, he has just been a sniper from deep. And I think there's been a lot of flashes of him improving in other areas as well. Putting the ball in the deck, finishing at the rim, getting to spots in the mid range a small amount as well. Defensively, he's got the length to at least be somewhat of a deterrent at about six foot nine, six foot ten ish. The measurements for him at the combine, if he participates in that, will be fascinating. And I think will give us a little bit more clarity on how tall he actually stands right now. But he's an impressive prospect with his shot making ability. And I think if you look at Houston, one of the things that they just badly need is more raw shooting guys who can put the ball in the hoop off of the catch. And I think that's something Risa Share is going to do at a very high level for a long time in the NBA. This isn't maybe the highest ceiling pick, but I think given Houston's current collection of young talent with Whitmore, Green, Amon Thompson, Jabari Smith, I haven't even mentioned yet, they've got a lot of talented young players. And I think if you're looking to bet, on their potentials, putting them next to somebody like Risa Cher, who could be a floor stretcher, play with a little bit of gravity from the three-point line, that completely changes the geometry on an NBA court for them. And I think it's gonna open the game up and make everyone else just play a little bit better with a little bit more open space in the half court. Pick number four, we move on to the New Orleans Pelicans. Now, again, this pick comes from the Los Angeles Lakers. This is from the Anthony Davis trade still, which was how long ago? It feels like forever ago, but we're still seeing dividends here for the New Orleans Pelicans, who I like quite a bit. And I think that there's a lot of talent here on this team. And I think that they're in a spot where if they make the right draft pick and they make the right couple of additions, they could go from a really dangerous playoff team to a serious title contender and maybe even title favorite with how well their team is ran and built. And of course, Zion Williamson at the top, the head of the snake, he's extremely talented as well. So let's get a point guard in there. Nikola Topic playing for Red Star of the Euro League. And I think a lot of people are hoping to see him get back on the floor and really make an impact when he's back out there healthy. But the name of the game here for drafting a player like Nikola Topic is the playmaking, the floor vision. And I think the Pelicans have a little bit of a luxury here already having a collection of ball handlers. Brandon Ingram, I think one of the more underrated passers in the NBA. Zion Williamson, of course, we know how great he is with the ball in his hands. CJ McCollum is extremely talented as well. It's not necessarily that the Pelicans need a ball handler. It's not necessarily that they need a player who's going to be ball dominant, like I think Topic might play like in the NBA, but he's a player who I think is going to really elevate them in some of their dribble handoff action and some of their pick and roll action that they run because he's an adept passer, someone who can really read a defense, knows how to understand and read the backside of a defense, the weak side help, the strong side help, and he's just going to be a clean shot generator for New Orleans, a team that, listen, they've already got a lot of great wing pieces there, Ingram and uh, Zion we've already touched on, but then you talk about guys like Herb Jones, Trey Murphy the third. this team has a lot of length, size, defensive acumen already on the roster, so you get someone who maybe can even buff up that offense a little bit more just by being a smart, sound player who makes the right pass. This isn't a very typical New Orleans Pelicans pick under uh, Griffin because of his desire for length and size and guys who are defensive oriented. They have a lot of those types of players already, of course. But I think Topic is a guy who probably accentuates those pieces. I would love to give them an athletic rim running center. There just isn't one worth this pick here fourth overall. So instead we go with Topic and I think it's a pretty strong selection for a team that's already really, really talented. Pick number five, we move on to the Detroit Pistons. Of course, pretty unfortunate for them to have fallen all the way down to fifth in this mock draft. But the nice thing is about the 2024 NBA draft, 
The drop off between pick one, two, or three to pick five isn't as stark as it is in other years. Think back to last year getting pick one, well, that would have given you Victor Wembanyama, whereas Osar Thompson, listen, I still believe in him. I think he's going to be awesome for the Pistons, but there's a pretty clear differential there. Whereas in this draft, pick five, you still might get a very similar caliber player as you do at pick number one. So pick five here, I have the Detroit Pistons going with Cody Williams, who actually in my most recent mock was the number one overall pick to Detroit. I think this is a very good fit for them, gives them another ball handler, someone who I think is going to be an efficient downhill player. Now people are going to point to the lack of three-point shot volume, and I understand that, but he has been efficient on his three-point attempts this year, shooting above 40% for most of the season. Again, it's low volume. You're not drafting him to be a shooter. And if you're Detroit, obviously a player like Zachary Risa Cher might have been a better fit here. But he's already off the board. Third overall to Houston. Fifth overall the Rockets, uh, or the Pistons, excuse me, are in a spot where they're still in talent acquisition mode here. And drafting players who could be high-quality pieces, who could develop into you know, young stars in the league. I think there's a lot to bank on here with Williams. He's, I think, able to toggle between being a wing and an on-ball creator for them. And he's more of a player who I think is going to take a couple of years to really blossom into what he will become at some point in the NBA, which is, I think, a, a point forward type who can handle, get off of it, slash, cut, and do some of the dirty work on the defensive end as well with his length and size. Earlier this year, we saw him take on Isaiah Collier as the primary matchup on Collier. Now, unfortunately for Colorado and Williams, it didn't go super well for them, but I think he has the mindset and the mentality that he'll buy into those types of assignments. And with Detroit already having Osar Thompson and a collection of other young pieces, the developmental mindset here, the developmental approach where you're looking at it from a growth mindset, the Pistons down the road, again, it's not great to pick, not based off of fit or you know, maybe win now if you're Detroit, but I think Cody Williams is the right pick here, fifth overall. Pick number six, we move on to the Charlotte Hornets and a team that, listen, they're predicated right now on touch and finesse. And I really like LaMelo Ball as a player. I think he's extremely underrated nationally from the way that he's able to create shots, not only for himself, but for others. His ability to play around the paint without necessarily getting all the way to the rim. Sometimes kind of playing like Steve Nash, where he gets to the rim and dribbles through, kind of like TJ McConnell does currently as well for the Indiana Pacers. LaMelo Ball is a fascinating talent. And then, of course, drafting Brandon Miller, another outside-oriented player who's a little reliant on jump shots. Um, he has played very well in transition this year. Brandon Miller's had a fantastic rookie season, no doubt, for Charlotte. Sixth overall, though, we're looking at some things that they don't have. And I think rim pressure, playing through traffic, playing through physicality is something that they could still use a lot of. And fortunately for them, Ron Holland, a player who is a potential number one pick coming into the year, I still have him available here, sixth overall. And that's who the Hornets scoop up here with this selection. Ron Holland out of G League Ignite. He's been scoring the ball at a high volume down in the G League. Now his season is ultimately over. Unfortunately for the Ignite program, and there's some questions around the G League Ignite program about its future, but Ron Holland was one of the bright spots for them this season when it comes to his individual scoring numbers and his kind of ability that he showcased uh, when it comes to, again, playing through traffic, initiating, and then scoring through contact, I think was a real strong spot for him. He plays a little, little bit of a bully ball version of, uh, of style, but he's also quick, athletic, can play above the rim at times as well. And I think with his upside, I think he complements what Brandon Miller and LaMelo Ball both don't do. And you're looking at a fascinating trio there long term. And then hopefully Mark Williams can get healthy and hopefully the Hornets just find their stride all collectively as a very young team looking to put the pieces all together at the right time. Moving on to the Portland Trailblazers here at pick number seven. The Trailblazers is another interesting team. They have two lottery picks in this mock draft simulation here and I think with the Blazers what they're trying to kind of figure out right now what they're trying to solve is what pieces fit around Scoot Henderson and Anthony Simons long term and I think seventh overall drafting Matas Buzelis from the G League Ignite program is a good start. Portland right now they're rather interesting with the way that their team is built. They have a collection of guards, they have a collection of big men, they're kind of lacking some of the in-between pieces. When you look at, you know, Matisse Thibel, um, 
I mean, they just don't have like a lot of real forwards. Jeremy Grant, I know he's a forward. I know they're paying him a lot of money, but he doesn't rebound the ball. There's a big question right now on how much Jeremy Grant impacts winning, especially for a team that's not super talented. You know, I'm not the biggest Jeremy Grant fan myself, but I do think for Portland, if you're looking at it from a long-term perspective, it's about finding more players who can play the three or four position. I think Buzelis probably hits his ceiling playing more of the power forward in the NBA than he does playing the three. But I think with his skill set, you could probably use him in both roles a bit. When he's playing small forward, you could probably feed him in the post a little bit. He's shown the ability to score on duck-ins and post-ups and has a pretty nice turnaround uh, jump shot as well in the mid-range area that he likes to go to in post-ups. Uh, so I think you could take advantage of smaller matchups in that way. But I think his skill set as a cutter, someone who moves pretty well with the ball in his hands. You can run a few pick and rolls with him per game handling the basketball. I think you'll find some unique situations where you want to use him as a short roller and have him be an initiator out of the middle of the floor. There's a lot of things that he can do from a playmaking perspective and having the ball in his hands. And he operates well off of the baseline as well. So I think a player who you see a lot of stars operate out above the break and off the top of the key where it's harder to get doubled. Finding a player like Buzelis, who I think works the baseline well as a cutter, can move off the wing well, low post, mid post areas. He gives you an interesting counter piece to the way teams are going to hopefully in the future try to guard Anthony Simons by aggressively blitzing him in the ball uh, in ball screens. And with uh, Scoot Henderson, of course, when he gets to the rim, having someone like Buzelis there for dump off passes and 15 foot catch and shoot mid range jump shots, it's not the most efficient shot. It's the most not the most desirable shot, but I think it's going to give Portland some unique spacing opportunities to kind of take advantage of how defenses are going to want to guard Henderson in the future. Moving on to pick number eight, we're back to San Antonio. And the Spurs, remember, second overall, we went with Kentucky guard Reed Shepard. And it was so nice that they're gonna do it twice here. Eighth overall, the Spurs go with Rob Dillingham, another Kentucky guard, and the bench mob duo for the Wildcats. Both go to San Antonio, and I love this for the Spurs. For a team that was low on ball handling and shot creation and playmaking and just overall electricity out of the backcourt, well, they might have gotten the most electric player in the backcourt in this year's draft here, eighth overall in Rob Dillingham, a player who I love a lot. Again, if this was a big board, he'd be much higher than number eight. Right now, I'm a big believer in Dillingham's game. I know haters are going to point to the fact that he doesn't have a ton of dunks this year, and he's a smaller prospect. He's rather light defensively. He's not the strongest uh, prospect in this draft by any means. But what I do know is this kid can create shots. He can make shots. He's got deep range to him. And I think he's an underrated athlete as well. I threw down a couple windmill dunks this year already. He's been an impressive player. I think he's one of the big names to watch in March Madness this year. I think he's going to take the world by storm if he has a crazy game or two. And people are going to say, oh my gosh. And we might look back on this and say, eighth overall, what? He might be the first or second overall pick. And I wouldn't be surprised about that. Really, when I mock Reed Shepard's second overall to the Spurs, I seriously consider Rob Dillingham at that spot. Because I think that they could really look either direction. Here. And the fact that they got both of them in this draft is just a huge win for them. A team that I think needs more playmaking, more creativity, more scoring punch out of the backcourt next to Devin Vassell. Not only did they get one good guard prospect, they got two really good guard prospects who already work extremely well together. And I think would give San Antonio a good bit of scoring punch going forward. Pick number nine, we move on to the Memphis Grizzlies now. And for Memphis here specifically at this spot, I think when you're looking at this team, there's a lot of things I wanted to consider. I thought about a backup point guard, someone like Isaiah Collier out of USC, and what could that look like behind John Morant? We know how important Tyus Jones was there for Memphis for a while, but then I thought back to the Steven Adams trade, and I thought, okay, they sent away a great box out rebounding big man for what reason? I'm not exactly sure. Money savings, maybe they have a, their eyes on a free agent this offseason. Cough, cough, Nick Claxton, who knows? We'll see what happens there with Memphis. But given the fact that the Grizzlies here fell to ninth in this mock, given the lottery simulation, I thought this is too good of an opportunity for them to readdress the need that they opened up by trading Steven Adams. And I have them drafting Donovan Klingon here from UConn. And I know there's a, a big split right now on Klingon. He's not your prototypical 
dominant big man who is going to win solely off of talent. But what I do know is he's a huge big body player who's going to be pretty good in drop coverage. I think he's going to offer a ton of length, size, shot blocking at the NBA level. And I think he's going to rebound the basketball. And I think if you have one big concern about Jaron Jackson going forward, it's the rebounding. And I think that's not really a well-hidden secret. I think every team in the league knows Jaron Jackson Jr. is not the most potent rebounder. We can get to the offensive glass against him. And I think if the Grizzlies really want to secure their defense once again and improve their offense by having more length, more size, a good screen setter on the floor next to John Morant, someone like Donovan Klingon does make a ton of sense in those regards. His monstrous 20 and 15 games, he's not going to rack those up in the NBA. But what I could see him doing is having eight points and 10 rebounds rather consistently. And while that doesn't sound like the sexiest pick here ninth overall, I think the big thing for Memphis is putting together a good team identity and getting someone who's going to hit the offensive glass and the defensive glass has been a mainstay for what has made them super good in the past couple of years when they've been all healthy and the team has been rolling. And I think they have a chance here to, again, reinvigorate themselves with some youth who lives up to that play style. And I think Donovan Klingon makes a good deal of sense here for the Grizzlies ninth overall. Moving on to pick number 10, we look at the U. Todd Jazz now in the Jazz. This pick is top 10 protected, so they just barely hold on to this pick in this mock draft simulation. And they're gonna make the most of it here, drafting Isaiah Collier out of USC, former top recruit, one of the big names from this past recruiting cycle. USC got him, and he's been playing some of his best basketball over the last couple of weeks or so. His assist to turnover ratio has skyrocketed in a good way. You've also seen his scoring numbers tick up pretty significantly. He's shooting the three ball a little bit more confidently. The three pointers are falling a little bit more regularly. He's been a great piece this season for USC. And I think with them making a little bit of a late push in the Pac-12, obviously not really having the season that they wanted for themselves, but Isaiah Collier is a player who with his recent play, his recent stretch of performances, I think has solidified himself as a lock to go in the lottery. I think a lot of people were already looking at him that way. I thought he was more borderline lottery-ish, just given what his size is and also looking at what his probable detriments are in the NBA as a shooter, what's his reluctancy. And defensively, I think he's rather limited, but he's got a huge frame for a point guard when it comes to how he's built. He's built like a linebacker. He's strong, physical. He's one of the better finishers in college basketball. Now, I do think he is destined to have a pretty bad rookie season in the NBA because typically a lot of young guards struggle adjusting to the NBA, especially when it comes to finishing. And the fact that his game as a scorer is more inside than out, you're gonna probably see his scoring kind of come in waves where there's gonna be nights where he's finishing at the rim and there's going to be nights where players like Rudy Gobert, Walker Kessler, obviously teammate with the Jazz if he lands there, but some of the better shot blockers, rim protectors and anchors in the NBA are going to cause some problems for him. But I think for Utah, a team that's more focused on the long-term future, accumulating assets, accumulating young talent, they're okay with taking that kind of risk and drafting Isaiah Collier here is a huge win for them. Pick 11, we move on to the Atlanta Hawks, a team that, listen, right now, if you ask me who's going to be on their roster in three months, I really don't know. That's a that's a great question. Is DeJounte Murray going to be there? I don't know. Will Clint Capella be an Atlanta Hawk? I don't know. Will Trey Young be an Atlanta Hawk? I still do not know. We'll have a lot to figure out about this Hawks team, but what I do know is with where they're currently at, this team has a great opportunity with two picks in this year's draft to start building up a young core once again. They have some young pieces I already like, and they're going to add to that with Stefan Castle here out of UConn, a player who is really shifty, creative with the ball in his hands. He's got a big, good NBA frame. I think he's an extremely talented player. The only question with him is the outside jump shot. Adjusting to the NBA three-point line will be a big challenge for him. He's already a hesitant shooter when it comes to the NCAA three-point line. So you're looking at a question here of how does Stefan Castle adjust to the NBA? How does he really make a mark as a scorer in the league? But with a dynamic creative handle, I think you're looking at a player who, listen, last year the Hawks drafted Kobe Bufkin with the likelihood that one of DeJounte Murray or Trae Young is not back in Atlanta 
going into next season. I still think a third guard does make some sense for them. And I think with Castle's game and his play style, you could afford to play him on the wing. Atlanta is going to be able to have a collection of ball handlers, guys who can create and initiate offense. You can never have enough of those players in today's NBA with the pace, the style of play, the faster you can play, the better. And I think Stefan Castle can contribute to that while also still having a very high ceiling because if his three-point shot does come along, does develop, there's a real argument you might be getting one of the best players in this year's draft just given the fact that he has the size. Again, he has the length. Defensively, I think he's going to project pretty well into the NBA. It's going to take him some time, I think, to adjust to the league. Uh, but defensively, he's got a lot of the traits you're looking for. And then from the offensive perspective, again, able to work in tight space, finish at the rim. He's crafty, plays off of two feet well, can play with ball fakes, can play without ball fakes, can play quick, can play slow. Players like that are valuable. And I think Atlanta here, you're going to have to wait a little bit to get all of those de developmental pieces out of Castle. But he's a player that has been high on a lot of people's radar for a while now for good reason. I think the Hawks here get an intriguing upside pick with Stefan Castle here in the lottery moving on to pick number 12 we have the Oklahoma City Thunder here now what a great season for them this pick comes from the Houston Rockets from the Russell Westbrook Chris Paul swap and the Thunder have a prime opportunity to continue to implement and add more young talent to their roster and with this pick I have them going with Kyle Filipowski who has just been great this season for the Duke Blue Devils. One of the big things for them uh, in the tournament is going to be seeing how he handles pressure. How does he handle smaller guys on him? How does he handle bigger guys on him? We're going to learn a lot yet about Filipowski going into this NCAA tournament, but he's been extremely productive for them, scoring the ball at a high rate for them again this season, being a hub of the offense for them. And I think if you look at the way that Oklahoma City plays with Chad Holmgren playing predominantly the center spot this year, Filipowski probably projects to be a hybrid 4-5 in the NBA. The reason why Chet Holmgren is so effective as a 5 is he's one of the lengthiest players in the league and he uh, blocks shots at an extremely high rate, high level. Filipowski is not going to give you that kind of rim protection, that kind of defensive capability. But similar to what we've seen from Mike Muscala in his time with Oklahoma City, you're getting a player who's probably going to be able to stretch the floor Kind of similar to Kelly Olynyk in some ways for Filipowski here, who a lot of people wanted to see land in with the Thunder this past trade deadline. Of course, that did not happen, but he can handle the ball. He can push tempo in transition. This gives the Thunder another skilled perimeter big man. And perhaps you could play lineups with Filipowski and Holmgren both on the floor if you're trying to match up with teams like Minnesota and Denver. Having a little bit more length and size on the court would be beneficial for the Thunder moving forward in some of those future playoff matchups. So Filipowski, I think, checks a lot of the boxes here for OKC at pick number 12. Moving on to pick 13, we're in the Windy City here now with the Chicago Bulls. And this selection, I think, is a pivotal one for them. Starting kind of their retooling, the Nikola Vucevic thing just has not worked out. They've tried, they've tried, they've tried. That is going to go down as one of the worst trades in Chicago Bulls history. That might sound hyperbolic. It's not. Trust me, it was a bad trade. Right now, if you went back and tried trading any of those players for Nikola Vucevic, the Bulls would probably say yes. Maybe not Jed Howard, but to be honest, you don't really know because Nikola Vucevic just has not been good for Chicago. But I think if you're looking for them building around a center long term, they're going to take a developmental project here. They do have Vucevic under contract for a couple of seasons. Andre Drummond is a free agent at the end of the year. So drafting someone like Eve Misi playing for the Baylor Bears is an intriguing upside pick. He just continues to get better from where he was the first game of the season for Baylor to where he is now. I would say there's been tremendous progress, both from an IQ and positioning perspective on where he's standing on the floor and his help side timing and utilization of his athletic traits. He's extremely athletic, a good above the rim finisher. I think when he really is on his A game, He's going to be blocking shots at a high rate and a high level because of his athletic tools, good shot block timing. He's an impressive prospect for physically. And I think as he's continuing to improve from the IQ department and being in the right place at the right time on the basketball court, that's where you're gonna see him really blossom and grow. So for Billy Donovan, getting him in early, I've said it for a long time here on the channel, if you're drafting a center, you have to draft him a year or two before you really need them to play high volume minutes. 
I think Eve Misi can be a good contributor for the Bulls down the road as they're looking to probably start a rebuild and a retooling around maybe some of their younger players like Kobe White. It's going to be important for them to take the long-term approach, draft players, and focus on development. And I think Eve Misi could be a good starting point for them 13th overall. Pick number 14, we move on to the Portland Trailblazers. Now this is their second pick. Here in the lottery, remember, first, uh, their first pick, we went with Matas Buzelis. And 14th, they have an opportunity to add another wing player. And I talked about Buzelis maybe toggling between the small forward and power forward spot. Here they're getting a wing who probably plays shooting guard and maybe a bit of small forward in Jacoby Walter, who is an outside shooter. Now, if you look at his overall tape this year, the inside finishing is a little bit to be desired. His overall field goal percentage is not great. But in the NBA, he's going to be a true shooting percentage king because he's going to shoot a very high volume of three-point attempts. Going back to even the first game of the year that he played for Baylor, he set the Baylor Bears freshman debut record with 28 points. And that game has just stuck with me all season long because even though the ups and downs have been there, he hasn't been super consistent for Baylor. Baylor themselves haven't been the most consistent program over the last couple of years after some key departures. Think back to their national title run. I think Baylor is a team that, with the talent that they've been able to kind of recruit and develop over time, Jacoby Walter kind of stands out as one of the better shooters that this program has produced in the last couple of years and a player who I think for Portland, again, if you're looking on supplementing Scoot Henderson with surrounding talent, floor stretching and shooting is going to be at the forefront of that. We've seen Duop Reith have a pretty good rookie season for them. I'm not the biggest Duop Reith believer myself, but the idea of having players who can stretch the floor, dry out the defense, I think it's going to open up more driving lanes for Scoot Henderson. I think Anthony Simons, again, another player who is just an extremely talented offensive player, having more spacing around him, a player who can probably set ghost screens, do a bunch of different things on that from a half court offensive set perspective. The more options the Blazers have when it comes to shooting and scoring, the better. I think Jacoby Walter here fits pretty well into what Portland wants to continue adding onto their roster. Moving on to pick number 15, we're now out of the lottery. So this is dependent here on playoff teams and their records by the end of the season. And Philadelphia thinks a great example of a team that with Joel and B going out, this team's a lot better than the 15th pick in the draft would indicate but they've fallen quite a bit since Embiid's injury, but this could be a really great opportunity for them to add some good talent when it comes to the draft. And 15th overall, I have them going with Dalton Connect out of Tennessee. And Connect is a player right now where the volunteers are asking him to do a lot, and he is very overtaxed there. Having to score, and defensively, he hasn't been as, I would say, involved as he's capable of being because he's a wing with good size, physicality, strength, and a good athlete to boot. He's an overall astounding player. He's actually third in the nation right now in points per game this season. He's shooting over 46% from the field, and he's shooting over uh, six three-pointers a game at a 39.7% clip. So he's been extremely effective offensively at a very high volume this season for Tennessee. He initiates a lot of their offense, he creates a lot of their offense, and he scores the ball a ton. And I think translating into Philadelphia, part of the reason why this makes sense, first of all, he's gonna be 23 years old on by the day of the draft. So you're looking at an older prospect, and because of that, a lot of teams are gonna say, whoa, I'm not sure, the ceiling might not be there, the potential might not be there. This is actually perfect for Philadelphia, who is poised to have a good deal of cap space this offseason. Finding a player on a rookie contract who can come in and produce for them right away and fit into a role. This is the beautiful thing about Connect adjusting to the NBA. Instead of having to be the guy, having surrounding talent like Tyrese Maxey, like Joel Embiid, that's going to be awesome for him. He's going to be able to kind of adjust and settle into a role as a three-point shooter and a transition scorer and somebody who is the third or fourth scorer on the floor. And I think the game's going to be a lot easier to him. He's already efficient as a high volume scorer. Now, of course, some of that comes from playing in a rhythm and knowing that you're the guy. It does open up a lot of players to play the game the way that they're comfortable playing. So that'll be something to monitor with Connect. But I think playing next to Embiid and Maxi will make the game a lot easier for him. He'll get easier looks, he'll get open opportunities. And because of that, I think it's a great opportunity for him and for the Sixers to kind of come together in unison 
build a team that, look, they're trying to win, they're gonna be aggressive in free agency, they're gonna to look to use cap space, they're gonna be aggressive, maybe they would even trade this pick, who knows, we'll see, but if Connect is on the board for them, it's a great opportunity to draft, get his production in the door for relatively cheap on their cap table, and still be able to go out and spend in free agency. Moving on to pick number 16, we move down to Miami, and with the heat at this spot, I've had a lot of fun mocking players for the Miami Heat this year. And think back to last year drafting Jaime Jaquez. They have an opportunity here to get another player who is an upperclassman in this year's draft. And that is AJ Mitchell from UC Santa Barbara. And this kid can flat out play. I was just talking about Dalton Connect and his high volume scoring this year. AJ Mitchell actually ranks sixth in the nation in scoring this season at 20 points per game but as a six foot three guard, he's shooting over 50% from the field. And he's not a very high volume three point shooter, just a few attempts a game, two to three attempts per game from behind the arc. But you're looking at a player who plays off of two feet well. I think he's going to be able to draw fouls in the NBA because of his up and under game, his ability to sell head fakes and ball fakes, get defenders up off their feet and probably create a good deal of contact that way. And for Miami, yes, I know they traded for Terry Rozier. Yes, I know they have Tyler Hero. Obviously, Jimmy Butler does a lot for their offense. Bam Adebayo dribbles the ball quite a bit. But finding another upperclassman player who can step in, be a good contributor into the Heat culture, I think that a player like AJ Mitchell really stands out to me. I'm much higher on him than most other people right now in the draft community. I think this kid could be very similar to the next Jalen Brunson. Now, the big differentiator between him and Brunson, Brunson was a big time three point shot maker at Villanova. AJ Mitchell, a little bit more gun shy from behind the arc, but the two, their style of play is very similar. Both of them are left-handed, which obviously leads into my comp a bit, but the way that they play, feet on the ground, steady, win with a pivot game, win with their footwork and positioning, I think he's going to be a real steal in the NBA. I know a lot of people are looking at him as more of a second round pick or a back end first round pick right now. I would firmly look at him as a lottery selection when it came to my big board currently. Now, a lot can change, right? We've still got a couple of months before the draft, so I'm not locking myself into that currently, but I do like AJ Mitchell a lot. I think this is a huge steal for the Miami Heat, and I think this is just a perfect player for a team that's always dangerous nonetheless. Pick 17, we're now looking at the Toronto Raptors. This pick comes from the Indiana Pacers. Of course, earlier in this mock, the Raptors lost out on their first round pick in their trade for Jakob Pertl with the Spurs, but here they have an opportunity to go out and get better. And I think a player like Johnny Furphy here from Kansas does make a good deal of sense. Last year, we saw Masai Ujiri in the lottery draft Grady Dick out of Kansas, a shooter. And typically Masai Ujiri over the last half decade or so hasn't valued shooting as much as the rest of the league. And when it comes to actual talent from a shooting perspective or solely shooters, Johnny Furphy is another guy who, listen, we know that they draft from the Jayhawks now. Let's do it again here in this mock. And the reason why I like Furphy for them, it gives you another wing who can stretch the floor. They just traded for it and re-signed Kelly Olynyk to an extension. I like what they have in the front court currently with Scotty Barnes when he's healthy. Obviously, we know how talented of a player he is, a well-deserving all-star this year. You look at, uh, obviously, they have Pirtle, they have Kelly Olynyk. I didn't really think center was a need for them. They have their point guard of the future with Emmanuel Quickly now. They have RJ Barrett. It's just about finding more wing talent and more shooting that can complement their current existing core. Furphy and Grady Dick could be the nice complementary pieces to a good, talented young Raptors team right now. I think that their style of play, the way that they're moving the ball has been impressive. Uh, this year, obviously Darko came in with a kind of long list of things he wanted the team to play uh, to and, and a kind of style that he wanted to adopt with them. I think that they're growing in some of those areas, but with a lot of trades this year, some of the injuries that they've had, it's been tough for them to kind of rack together a ton of wins. But I still think that the Raptors are a team that Give them some time, let their pieces kind of fit together, morph together, put shooting around them, and let's really see what they look like in a couple of seasons. Pick number 18, we're on to the Phoenix Suns now. And the Suns, one thing that stands out to me watching them, Frank Vogel just doesn't really trust the big men and feels like he has to go small a ton. And if you know Frank Vogel, that's not really what he loves to do. Back in the 2020 bubble, when they won the NBA championship when he was the Lakers head coach, he won by playing a center next to Anthony Davis for most of that playoff 
run. And I think looking back at when he found success in Indiana with David West playing power forward and Roy Hibbert playing center, he likes to have big bodies on the court. I think it's important for his defense and I think it's important for the way that he wants to play the game. So we need to find a big bodied player here. And Tijan Salon is still on the board out of Chalet. He's a talented prospect. Now the production isn't all quite there yet, but you're looking at a player who stands at about six foot 10, has an outside inside game, can probably still be an offensive complimentary piece next to Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, and Devin Booker, but it just gives you another player who offers some length, size, defensive versatility is what you're really hoping for with him. I think a decent comparison might be PJ Washington. You're kind of hoping to get that kind of career arc out of him. You're looking for players who, as a power forward in the NBA, can put the ball on the deck, shoot from the outside, defend across multiple positions. I think that Salon, if things go right in his career, he's going to be able to give you a good deal of, uh, of those things. Now for Phoenix, it's very possible that they would trade this pick on draft night as well and just continue looking to be aggressive to improve their team. I really don't like the Suns' long-term future. They've got to be very cautious and hopefully they're able to figure things out long-term because right now with the amount of assets that they owe out the door, this team is, I don't think, trending in the right direction, to be honest with you. And people were pretty harsh on me when I said I thought they'd be like a seven seed or eight seed this year. Well, they're sitting at pick 18 for a reason. The team's just not that good. They're very reliant on their big three, obviously a really great and talented big three, but they're just not very deep. They don't have a lot of reliable size. Use of Nurkic, I think, has been pretty good for them this year. And there's still a lot of flaws on the way this team is built. So, you know, Phoenix, there's going to be a lot of questions moving forward about this team. How do they kind of navigate a lack of assets? Drafting well or using these picks as trades uh, will be pretty determining for how the Suns look three, four, five, six, seven years from now. Pick number 19, we move on to the New York Knicks. This pick comes from the Dallas Mavericks. And I think 19th overall here, the Knicks, again, another team to watch for when it comes to trading these draft assets, looking for them to either trade them for a star on draft night or trade pick 19 and pick 21 out to future years. But assuming that they keep the selections here, 19th overall, I have them going with Devin Carter out of Providence, and he's been a high volume scorer as well. Ranks just behind AJ Mitchell, who went a few picks earlier uh, when it comes to scoring the basketball this year, scoring about 19.7 points per game. He's shooting about 47% from the field. Now, he is a high volume three point shooter. And I think for New York, we've seen them kind of have to figure out how to score the basketball, especially with Julius Randle out. That's been a bit of a challenge for them. And I think a big reason why is when Jalen Brunson goes off the court, they just don't have that same kind of offensive punch off the bench. And it's hard to replicate that, right? But I think turning a player like Deuce McBride, who has been awesome for the Knicks at times this year, into a Devin Carter type, who's more of a natural scorer, someone who's going to hunt his own shot a bit more and offer some three-point shooting and range uh, on the offensive. And that's going to do a lot of wonders for the Knicks offense when Brunson and or Randall are not on the floor. And I think for New York going forward, if they do keep these picks and if they don't target a star or some good offensive upgrades in the trade market, a player like Devin Carter just does make a ton of natural sense when it comes to upgrading this current Knicks roster without having to sacrifice a lot of their long-term flexibility and their long-term you know, kind of team construction with a defensive mindset already in place. Pick number 20, we're back to Atlanta now. The Hawks here, this pick comes from the Sacramento Kings in the Kevin Herter trade. And the Hawks, with them already addressing a guard in this draft, we're gonna actually go with Bobby Clintman playing for the Cans Titans, a player who I think is an intriguing upside bet in this year's draft. Very similar prospect to Tijan Salon, maybe not quite as talented, not quite as productive, but a very similar play style archetype. He's gonna be a power forward who's gonna look to work off the baseline, I think Salon, a player who's going to probably gravitate and hover toward the top of the key and above the break a little bit more, whereas Clintman probably going to be a wing to corner type player where he's going to look to backdoor cut you out of the corner, go for offensive rebounds on shots as a corner crasher, and also just somebody who I think you can use him in a few different ways as well. You can use him as a ball screener and roll man. You can use him as, I think, a transition 
pace pusher, which will be interesting to see how much he gets to play into that early in his career in the NBA. Now, again, the Hawks, there's a log jam on this roster right now. They have DeAndre Hunter coming off the bench currently. Obviously, Jalen Johnson, his ascension this year has been vital for the Hawks and their long-term outlook, even though there's been kind of struggling moments this year and a lot of them for Atlanta. Jalen Johnson has been one of the big bright spots for them. They have Nyeka Kongwu, Clint Capella. We know that there's a lot of pieces right now in Atlanta, but I think if you're looking at it from a long-term perspective, drafting developmental upside players like a Bobby Clintman does make some sense. He's got natural size, length. He's flashed some shooting growth this year. Um, a lot of people looked at him as a potential first-round pick last year coming out of Wake Forest. I was a little bit more gun-shy on that. Ended up not coming out for the draft, went to the NBL, and I think now is a first-round pick in a slightly weaker 2024 NBA draft. Moving on to pick 21, we have the Orlando Magic. Sorry, I almost started singing the TikTok song. It's been so catchy. I love that. It's just, I, I swear to God, I think of it like five times a day, every single day. But the Orlando Magic here, I have them going with Jared McCain. While there's questions about their backcourt right now, Markel Fultz specifically, he's an expiring contract. Where will he be playing basketball next season? Is it in Orlando? Is it not? Obviously, Cole Anthony's a key piece there. I think for the Magic, you're just looking for more backcourt stability and more backcourt shooting specifically. And I think McCain, someone who is a high volume catch and shoot player right now for the Duke Blue Devils, he comes to mind as a player that would fit next to a Jalen Suggs, fit next to a Paolo Boncaro and a Franz Wagner, fit next to Anthony Black, assuming Anthony Black steps into an even bigger role next season. Someone like Jared McCain, who I, I think can still get after it on the defensive end of the floor. I don't think you're sacrificing too much of your defensive identity here if you're if you're Orlando, while well as you know trading for someone like Anthony Simons or like a Trey Young type. There's more concerns there about what does your defense look like then. Jared McCain, you're drafting him, you're probably not gonna give him a ton of minutes early in his career. I think you're gonna be able to walk him along defensively, but he can still get after it. He's active, has quick hands, quick feet. I think he's a player who, with his three-point shooting and off-ball capabilities, he's one of the guards that you would like to see there in Orlando. And listen, I'm not even against the Anthony Simons, Trey Young type. I'm not against a DeJounte Murray in Orlando, but I do think if they do slow play this year and they don't trade these picks and they don't trade some of their young pieces for an established point guard, Going someone like a Jared McCain just makes sense, someone who is off ball. And, and the question is how much of your ball handling responsibility do you want to divvy away from Franz Wagner and Paolo Boncaro? And I think the answer to that is probably not a ton. Now, for Orlando to really reach their offensive heights that they've loved to get to, you probably do need an improved point guard there. Jared McCain's probably not gonna be the guy that takes away some of that load and some of that pressure from, from Boncaro and Wagner but I do think he is a nice complimentary piece. And at 21, he fits the way that the Magic probably need to play a little bit more offensively. Uh, and I think his spacing and kind of off ball play would fit them rather well. Pick 22, we now move on to the New York Knicks. And I think for New York here, again, with this pick, they already had pick 19, we're at 22 now for them. And Khalil Ware is a player who stands out to me for them with this pick. Isaiah Hartenstein has been excellent for the Knicks this year and obviously we know what uh, Mitchell Robinson is when he's healthy and on the floor he's one of the most devastating offensive rebounders in the league he's super long athletic just every time I feel like I watch Mitchell Robinson there's like one or two plays a game where I'm like oh my gosh did he just get that rebound or wow he really threw that down with a with a dunk wow he just every time I watch him he impresses me physically I just want to see him stay healthy but this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with Chicago earlier when we had them draft Eve Misi. You have to draft a center before you need him. And I think drafting Khalil Ware here, a player who I think has really thrived this year for the Hoosiers. He's a big time prospect and very similar to uh, Mitchell Robinson in some ways, just very impressive physically, has some crazy athletic plays, some physically imposing moments where you're just like, oh my goodness, how do you handle a player like this who's super athletic, lengthy, and just a ginormous human being. For the Knicks, I think it's about, okay, we get him in the building, probably gonna be able to play him a bit as either Hardenstein or Robinson are hurt at times. There's going to be some minutes available for him throughout the course of his early career, but then maybe by year two, year three, year four of his career, whether that means a Mitchell Robinson trade or Isaiah Hardenstein either leaves in free agency at some point or they trade him somewhere as well. Like there could be a way for Khalil Ware to start logging real minutes. 
for the Knicks. There was a lot of teams between about picks 14 and 22 that I thought about for Khalil Ware. I'm a big believer in his game. I was looking for the right fit for him, and I think New York with Tom Thibodeau is probably the best spot for him to land and to grow and develop as a player without having to be thrown into the fire too early. Moving on now to pick number 23. Remember the Pelicans earlier on went with the selection of Nikola Topic fourth overall. So 23rd, again, I wanted to look at a center. Khalil Ware would have been the perfect center. I would have wanted to mock to New Orleans. He's off the board now. So what do we do 23rd overall here? And this is a little unconventional. A lot of Pelicans fans are going to say, oh my gosh, we don't need this. But it fits the way that they like to play. And it's with a lot of length, size, and defensive talent on the floor. And I'm not sure if there's a better defensive talent in the draft than Ryan Dunn, who is one of the most impressive defensive prospects I have ever evaluated from the wing position specifically. Now, centers typically have more defensive impact because they're just anchoring a defense, blocking shots of the rim, you know, kind of playing help side, weak side rim protection a ton. Ryan Dunn does it in a different way. He's a player who is one of the better point of attack defenders I've ever evaluated, but he also has the capability of just making some wow plays off the basketball. Defensively, he's one of the best defensive playmakers I've ever evaluated, but he doesn't sacrifice defensive playmaking for bad defense. Like he doesn't just make defensive plays after being out of position. In fact, he does a great job of cutting guys off getting in position and keeping his chest in front of ball handlers. And I think KBIF defense, keep ball in front, is one of the best things you can evaluate when you're evaluating a defensive player. How well does he keep the ball in front of his chest? And does he have to, does he force the ball handler to, to turn direction and take longer getting to the rim? How many straight line drives does he allow? And the, the answer is Ryan Dunn's really clean defensively. He does a great job Staying on a ball handler's hip, he doesn't give up straight line drives frequently. We know what Virginia has been as a defensive breeding ground for just overall great defensive talent coming into the league. The issue for them has always been how do they score the basketball at the college level? And then the question for their prospects has been how do they score the ball in the NBA? Trey Murphy's one of the outliers for the Virginia Cavaliers. But I think for New Orleans here, drafting a Ryan Dunn, Listen, you already have Herb Jones, you have Trey Murphy. There's not minutes to give to Ryan Dunn right away. I don't care. You draft him, you develop him, and at some point, if some big trade comes along and you feel like, oh my gosh, we might have to trade one of Trey Murphy or Herb Jones, or maybe Brandon Ingram's not going to be a Pelican for the rest of his career, whatever happens, you have this guy waiting in the wings. He's a player who you trust. You can put out there for 30 minutes a game if you need to, and he's going to lock down the other team's best player. He's not going to probably limit them to you know two points or anything, but he's gonna make their life a living hell. And that's the exact type of player you wanna have sitting around waiting. Drafting him here, I know people are gonna to point to the offensive deficiencies. He's a jump shot away from being a top five pick in this draft probably. He's that good defensively. People are gonna question how he's gonna score in the NBA. I think he's an active cutter. This is a this is a player that if you're a Sacramento Kings fan watching right now, this is the type of player the Kings should trade back into the first round to get. Someone like this who I think could really complement DeMontis Sabonis, could complement Keegan Murray, and the Kings have the offensive in infrastructure to really make a player like this work as a backdoor cutter and out of their zoom action, finding ways to navigate him getting to the rim where he's actually a really elite finisher. Part of that is he's extremely athletic and lengthy. He can finish above college defenses. I think adjusting to the NBA is going to be a little bit more of a challenge for him, but New Orleans, who also plays with a zoom style offense, I think they're going to be able to create opportunities for him to score. And it's just a good insurance policy in case they want to make future trades down the road. This is just best player available. You run this pick to the podium if you're New Orleans and you never look back. Pick 24. We move on now to the Washington Wizards. This pick comes from the Los Angeles Clippers. Part of the Daniel Gafford trade, the Thunder had this pick and then obviously sent it to Washington through Dallas. This pick's been moved a bunch of times, but here are the Wizards now, after drafting Alex R first overall, have a chance to go and get a point guard and a player that they would want to put the ball in his hands quite a bit. And that is Carlton Carrington out of Pittsburgh. And this is an interesting draft prospect and a really fun one. His very first college game, he recorded a triple-double. And since then, I've been hooked on him. He's just a high-impact player who is very capable of impacting the game in a bunch of ways. He's comfortable handling the basketball, running pick and rolls, put the ball in his hands, you're going to have an offensive show. Now, 
You're not going to probably have a great offense. It's not going to be, there's a reason he's going 24th overall, right? You're not just walking into a player who's going to just dominate a game for you from an X's and O's standpoint, and he's just going to make the right play all the time and do everything perfectly. No, but there's a lot of upside here because he's got good natural size for the position. You're looking at a player who, again, he impacts the game in a bunch of ways. He's comfortable with the ball in his hands. He's someone who looks to score the basketball. Now, right now, <clears throat> evaluating his scoring talent, really the thing he lives best on is mid-range jump shots, which is the exact opposite the way that the NBA wants to play right now. Mid-range jump shots are really reserved for the best of the best in the NBA. Think the Kawhi Leonard's, Luka Doncic's, Kevin Durant's, Devin Booker's of the world. The premier players are the ones who are allowed to shoot mid-range jump shots. So Carlton Carrington, I think there's going to be a little bit of work for him when it comes to developing his offensive game and really adjusting to the NBA three-point line. I do think that's going to be a bit of a challenge for him, but from a playmaking field perspective, he does have it. He rebounds the ball. And I think this is going to be a player that they draft, probably gets similar production early in his career to what we saw from Michael Carter Williams back for the Trust the Process 76ers. Now, I don't think the volume is going to be there. He's not going to be averaging a triple double or not, you know, registering a triple double his first NBA game, probably. But I do think this is a player that there's upside for him to grow into, especially if the jump shot comes along. If you find ways to get him to the rim a little bit more frequently, that would be good for him as well. He's an impressive prospect though for me. And I think for Washington, this is the type of player who, listen, he's active, wants to be on the glass, does a bunch of different things for a team. This is the type of player you draft in the 20s and hope that it hits. And I think that he has the potential to grow into something pretty decent or nice for the Wizards, maybe DeLon Wright is another example of a player he could kind of emulate. Obviously, the Wizards saw him up close and personal the last couple of years. I think that that type of player is what you might be getting here with Bub Carrington. Pick 25, we move on to Cleveland now. At this spot, obviously, people are going to point to the Bronny James hype. I don't even want to talk about that in this video. Let's focus on who I have them picking here. Kaishan George from the University of Miami. Standing at about 6'8". He is someone who is shooting the ball extremely well this year for the Miami Hurricanes. That's really been the strength of his game this season is the way that he's been shooting the basketball, shooting over 40% from three this season. The Switzerland uh, native, that's where he's from, is Switzerland. He has shot this year 133s compared to just 62 pointers. So you're looking at a player whose shot diet exclusively lives behind the arc, but for a team like Cleveland, and, and this is why there's not a high ceiling here for a guy like Kaishan George, the, the self-creation, he doesn't get downhill a ton himself, he's not going to probably be an offensive creator for you, he's an off-ball wing-guard combo, where he's going to be able to move the ball, he is listed as a guard, right, does average some assists per game, but you're not looking, he averages two assists, so you're, you're not looking at a player who's going to just like blow you away, um, with his upside or his talent, but for Cleveland, that's not really what you need. You already kind of have your main core intact with Jared Allen, Evan Mobley, Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, and Isaac Okoro. So you're trying to find complementary pieces around that. Obviously, they've done a nice job getting Max Struess, George Niang. Those have been key essential gets for them when it comes to shooting the three ball. Kaishan George, it's kind of the same mentality here. Get someone who can stretch the floor, shoot the three, uh, and offer length and size, and that's exactly what Kaishan George has. Uh, standing about six foot eight. So an intriguing prospect here for Cleveland that fits what they would probably look to add onto their roster moving forward. Moving on to pick 26, we have the Milwaukee Bucks. And one of the big developments since the hiring of Doc Rivers has been the absence of Andre Jackson Jr. and Marjan Beauchamp from the rotation. So for Milwaukee, a team that is really old, they might be looking for an older draft prospect here, and the player that comes to mind for me, someone that I hope Doc Rivers would at least trust pretty early into his career, is Kevin McCullough Jr. out of Kansas. He's been very productive this season uh, for the Jayhawks, of course, was scoring a ton early in the year. I think his numbers have dwindled a little bit since, but I think he's a player who, he's got a lot on the line here for March Madness, but I think he's a player that, uh, with his skill set, People, teams are going to look at wings. They're going to look at wings from productive programs, from winning programs. McCuller Jr. obviously spent some time with Texas Tech, now playing for the Jayhawks. His production this year is going to be, I think, pivotal in him potentially finding his way into the first round. Think back to when a guy like Wendell Moore Jr. was a first round pick. I believe he was actually picked 26 as well, funny enough. And I think Milwaukee here looking for 
talent on the wings, guys who can shoot the basketball a bit and have some natural size and length and strength to them. Kevin McCullough's got an NBA ready body, a pro ready body, and I think he's going to stand out here for Milwaukee at this selection as they look to add players. Again, very likely they could trade this pick as well. I would not put that past them by any, by any means, but if they do pick, someone like Kevin McCullough Jr. does make a good deal of sense as well. Pick 27. Talking about the Minnesota Timberwolves here now. And with this pick, I think it is essential that the Timberwolves find someone who has a real chance of contributing for them in the long term and not the short term. Because right now, the Wolves, they have a very well-built 8, 9, 10-man rotation depending on who they keep this offseason. Kyle Anderson's a free agent. Monte Morris is a free agent. They already extended Mike Conley. They have an expensive tax bill. We'll see what they do. But... I think finding someone who has some long-term ceiling, long-term upside is going to be important for them. We saw them draft Leonard Miller in last year's draft in the second round. They also went with Jalen Clark, someone who is still recovering from a Achilles tear. So you're looking at them taking more of a long-term approach with their most recent draft picks as well. Justin Edwards is a player here who stands out to me just a couple of weeks ago, had his best game in college basketball where he scored, I believe, 28 points, didn't even miss a, a shot in that game was just highly productive and listen he's got a lot of the physical tools he was one of the higher recruits in this past recruiting cycle for minnesota here i think with tim Connolly, you look at where he's been he's not afraid to draft off of tools and skill sets and what he thinks a player will become not necessarily what they are already justin edwards has been shaky this year his three-point shot just really hasn't been there in his time at Kentucky for the most part. Now there's been flashes, there's been moments where it looks like he started to put two and two together and really find himself. And I think with the Wolves, it's kind of a risk here drafting him 27th overall, but if it hits, it could be a big time payout. He's a highly athletic, plays above the rim. And I think given the Wolves already kind of deep collection of athletic pieces on their roster, if they continue to build through athleticism and players who can cut and finish above the rim, Justin Edwards is a guy who stands out to me next to Jaden McDaniels and Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert and their pretty deep collection of big, lengthy, tall athletes already. You're now looking at adding one more into that bunch. Pick number 28, we have the Denver Nuggets here now. And unlike Minnesota, I think they're going to take more of a win now approach when it comes to the draft. We saw it last year with some of their draft selections. Uh, specifically Julian Strother, Hunter Tyson. So I think you're going to look at them adding players who can help them win. With this pick here, I have them going with Dayron Holmes the second out of Dayton. The flyer has been phenomenal this year. He's actually fifth in the NCAA in scoring this season, averaging over 20 points per game, and he's shooting over 54% from the field. It's just been dominant for Dayton uh, in the A-10 this season. Last couple of years, in fact, he's been really dominant. I am a Dayton Flyers fan myself. Dayron Holmes has one of the best jump hooks in college basketball right now. He's very good getting to his right hand, very poised in that way. And I think when you look at what he's going to be able to give you as well, adjusting to the NBA, over the last couple of years, he's starting to add a three-point shot. He's more comfortable playing be, uh, out on the perimeter and playing behind the arc specifically. So for Denver here, this is a kind of low risk, moderate reward type of move. Dayron Holmes is not gonna turn into a star player in the NBA. He's not gonna be a player that you're gonna build a team around or anything like that. The whole point of Denver drafting Dayron Holmes here is so that he can be your backup center for the next five years. That's your hope because behind Nikola uh, Jokic, they have not had any good backup center play in the last three, four years. Part of that is because their whole team is built around Nikola Jokic, so when he comes out of the game, it's hard to replicate that from the center spot. But Holmes, he's athletic, can play above the rim a bit, has a nice right baby hook like I've mentioned. I think he's got the kind of frame size skill set where you can do some things with him that they just currently don't do with DeAndre Jordan. Of course, now the Nuggets do have a little bit of that Reggie Jackson, DeAndre Jordan above the rim connection. They're in the top 10 in lobs connected on this year, which is pretty surprising, but funny. Uh, and I think that for Denver, like for regular season basketball, for the playoffs, Dayron Holmes probably would get excised from the uh, from the rotation, probably wouldn't play very much because they would just move to Aaron Gordon playing the five. But when it comes to regular season seating and positioning, having just another body to throw at other team centers for 15 minutes a night, I do think would be important for them. And I think Dayron Holmes II being a, a kind of polished college player 
He can step in and help you pretty quickly on into his career. He's gonna be cheap and affordable as a back end of the first round type selection. And I think it's a pretty good pickup here for Denver 28th overall. Moving on to pick number 29, we have the Utah Jazz on the clock again. This pick comes from the Oklahoma City Thunder uh, in what was the Kelly Olynyk trade. This pick, of course, uh, came through tr uh, from Toronto. Th this pick's been moved around a ton as well. So we're not gonna focus too much on that, but here is the Utah Jazz. And with this pick, I've been going with Tyler Smith out of G League Ignite. This is a high upside swing for them, a player who I think is very polarizing. A lot of people are big time believers in Tyler Smith. I think a lot of people are a little bit more critical uh, of him. But for me, a player that he reminds me of a ton is Terrence Jones, former Houston Rockets. Um, part of that is, I honestly think, just the left-handed comparison again. But they both got kind of similar play styles. Athletic, power forwards who can put the ball in the deck a bit, shoot the mid-range jump shot. Terrence Jones was kind of a developing three-point shooter earlier in his career. I think that's what Tyler Smith, you're hoping you're going to see that development from three as well for him. But there's a good deal of upside here. And if there's a team that's going to take a risk on a forward who can do a little bit of everything, it's probably going to be the team that Danny Ainge works for. So the Jazz here take a swing on Tyler Smith. I've seen people talking about him as a lottery pick. I myself have been kind of hovering around that. And then I'm like, I just don't know. He's one of the harder players to mock, honestly, for me right now, because I like some of his tools. But for me, it also kind of screams a little bit of Isaiah Todd, who was with the G League Ignite program a few years ago. I just wasn't a big fan of him while everyone else seemed to love him. I had him as like a player who was like a really late second round grade, didn't even really end up getting on the court too much in his NBA career. I kind of feel the same way about Tyler Smith, although I think he is better than Isaiah Todd quite a bit. But I, I, I think it's like the similar type of player where you're drafting him to be a power forward. There's not much positional versatility here. You're probably not gonna ever be able to play him as a three. Don't really see him being able to play the center spot at all. So because of that, you're just kind of limited in the way that you're going to be able to use him. So from a coaching perspective, I don't know if I love it, but I understand some of the upside as well that he seemingly has going forward. Pick 30, the Boston Celtics here now. Final pick here of this first round mock draft. I have them going with Dylan Jones. This is just a home run pick for Brad Stevens here. Highly productive player, ranks fourth in the NCAA in scoring over 20 points per game, shooting about 48% from the field, but he lives on a shot diet that I think could help Boston quite a bit. He shoots the three ball a bit, shoots some mid-range jump shots. Now I know Boston doesn't love those types of shots, but I think getting someone who is an off-ball player for them, he's not going to create or initiate a ton of offense next to Jason Tatum and next to Jalen Brown and obviously Derek White and the rest of the crew there in Boston with how talented their starting five is. Dylan Jones is going to be a, be a complimentary piece to that, but he's big, strong, physical. He's an older prospect coming out of Weber State. He's a senior, so you know you're going to get a mature player here. He's going to step in. He's going to be all about winning. He's going to work his tail off. He hits the glass extremely hard. He's comfortable playing with the ball in his hands. I think adjusting to playing without it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for him but he's got the frame, the size, the skill to do that. And I think for Boston here, it's just, hey, we're gonna get another big wing. And it gives us another body to throw at Giannis Antetokounmpo, gives them another body to throw at Joel Embiid in some ways. If you wanna put a smaller guy on him and use your you know, center as a roamer like Kristaps Porzingis has done at times this year for Boston, obviously they've been very creative in the way that they've played. And I think using getting a guy like Dylan Jones just gives them another body. This is kind of like a Grant Williams replacement a year later because they've got very similar size, you know, kind of components. They're both big, strong, physical players. Dylan Jones kind of similar height as well to Grant Williams. So getting a body like this just into the building does make some sense. Probably would be their ninth man early in their rotation. Maybe could turn into the eighth man, seventh man down the road. Uh, he's not going to be a high volume player for them. He's not going to score 15, 20 points a game like he is in college right now. But I think he's going to be a player that gives you a frame, size, strength, and some positional flexibility as well. Playing maybe the three and the four a little bit um, next to either Tatum or Brown or maybe both of them as well. So gives Boston just a little bit more natural size into their lineup. Thank you everyone so much for watching. I really hope you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.